Hello and welcome to the NPTEL MOOC course on Economics of Health and Education. In lesson 3 of this week, I will familiarize the learners with the ideas of uh, economics of production and uh, returns to uh, education or production of education and returns to education. Uh, without taking recourse to uh, sophisticated and advanced tools and techniques used for uh, estimating production functions of education or returns to education, we will mostly adopt a discussion format. Uh, to understand what does it mean when we say um, production of education and returns to education and we will take uh, help of the global data on education achievements to be able to understand this. Now, when we study uh, economics of education within the framework of neoclassical economics, we tend to uh, look at educational institutions as economic firms and uh, therefore, we try to understand how to use different kinds of inputs and how those inputs are transformed into quantifiable uh, output. Now, while the development of the concepts of uh, human capital and education has long term investment has enabled us uh, with various um, uh, frameworks and tools and techniques to be able to understand these kinds of production functions, often uh, education uh, poses various kinds of challenges or economics of education poses various kinds of challenges because of the very nature of the good that education is. Now, uh, we will uh, understand that uh, uh, education can be of various types. To begin with, we have uh, primary schooling, secondary schooling and tertiary uh, education. Uh, similarly, education is there are various kinds of providers as far as ed education is concerned. There are educational institutions in the government sector, in the private sector. There are also non-governmental organizations that provide uh, various kinds of education. Uh, similarly, it is not hard to understand that uh, there are different kinds of education output as well. For example, the expected output in uh, primary schooling is of course vastly different from what we are expected uh, from, from what we are expecting in terms of output in secondary schools and also in higher education institutions. But one of the important factors given these uh, diversities of um, issues contained in uh, analysis of education institutions is the fact that all educational institutions that impart skills and uh, training or that contribute to human capital formation cannot and do not be guided by the primary motive of uh, profits. And it is in this context we need to understand uh, production of education and returns to education. I have uh, designed uh, this class, this lesson in two parts. In the first part, we will uh, get introduced to the simple ideas of what production of education means, uh, what are the different kinds of inputs that we generally consider when we are looking at production of education, uh, what are the two important concepts in returns to education, what are the different variables that we um, uh, consider in returns to education. And in the second part, taking help of global data and education, we will see how uh, production empirical studies have concluded about production of education and returns to education. So, uh, since uh, you have all been introduced to health production functions, so, so a very basic idea of what a production function is in economics is clear to the learners by now. We do understand that production function basically refers to uh, a function which uh, transforms inputs into some amount of quantifiable output. Now, when we say inputs, there are of course various kinds of inputs as well as processes that go into the uh, transformation of output. Now, some of the key components involved in production of education uh, can look like this as is being shown on your slide. So, when we refer to inputs, we are mostly referring to the human capital which is teachers and staff in education institutions including the quality and quantity of teachers, administrative staff and other support staff. Uh, the students uh, refers to the characteristics such as socioeconomic background that the students come from, the cultural environment from which the students come from, the prior knowledge that they have, what are the motivations of joining an education institutions, also their health conditions and so on and so forth. Similarly, we can also consider education materials as inputs because households have to uh, allocate some of their resources to purchase of education materials. So, that would include textbooks and technology and other instructional materials that are used in education institutions. Uh, facilities uh, is another major input that is used that is considered in the production function. 
on the input side the independent variables. So, it can be quality and availability of school buildings, uh, classrooms, libraries, laboratories and other infrastructure. Uh, other financial resources for example, funding from government or private sources, uh, tuition fees that are paid by the households. Similarly, time, the amount of instructional time available for teaching and learning. These are some of the examples of inputs that we consider in a education uh, production function. Now, as I said, while there are inputs, there are also uh, processes in place. Now, these processes basically involve how these inputs are combined and utilized within educational institutions to provide a learning experience. In the last class, for example, I was talking about uh, um, pedagogy or uh, the intervention of ensuring that syllabuses are taught at the right level and what impact that can have on quality of education. So, if we consider quality of education as the output, then uh, the uh, pedagogy style or the kind of teaching, the quality of teaching can be considered as an input material. So, curriculum design, the development of academic content and learning objectives is one of the uh, processes, teaching methods. Uh, school management, the administration and organization of schools to create an effective learning environment. Similarly, assessments and evaluation are an important uh, uh, process or a method to measure student learning and educational outcomes. And uh, in the recent times, particularly there have been a lot of uh, uh, experimentations and evolutions in these methods of assessment and evaluation uh, for cross country comparisons. Uh, or subnational comparisons within a country and so on and this, this is an emerging area of uh, research as well as uh, uh, profit oriented work in various countries across the globe. So, what are the key components involved that we consider as outputs when we are considering production function? First of all, output refers to the measurable results of educational processes. Those who are interested in uh, modeling various kinds of production functions in education can consider uh, some of these variables and these are the variables that have been commonly utilized in various empirical studies as well. So, student achievement is one of the important outputs that we consider when we look at production function. Academic performance measured by grades, test scores, graduation uh, rates and so on. Uh, skills and competencies of the students who have acquired education, the acquisition of knowledge, critical thinking skills, problem solving ability, social skills, etc. We also look at uh, long term outcomes as the output. Uh, for example, education attainment, uh, that kind of degrees obtained, uh, whether those uh, education at, uh, attained can be utilized in the labor market or not, employment opportunities, earning potential and overall contribution to economic growth and societal well-being. So, if we put all of these uh, together, we also need to think about efficiency and effectiveness. Now, in the economics of education, there is a significant interest in the efficiency and effectiveness of production processes. What are the efficiency parameters that goes to you know give rise to a certain level of output whether it is student achievements or uh, quality of the labor force that we are producing from our educational institutions and so on. So, uh, efficiency basically refers to how well education inputs are converted into uh, outputs. This involves minimizing costs while maximizing education outcomes and effectiveness refers to the extent to which educational processes achieve desired outcomes such as high student achievement and equitable access to quality education and so on. Now, there are very many sophisticated methods of analyzing the different variables uh, to uh, estimate efficiency and effectiveness. However, in this lesson as I said we will take uh, examples from various empirical studies across the globe to understand uh, how do the uh, outcomes really look like in the context of production of education and returns to education. So, a standard production function would look something like this. Uh, so, you have uh, a production function which looks uh, like this. You have what are the inputs that enter into the production function. Here the dependent variable A refers to the skills learned. It could be in the form of education uh, years of attainment or it could be different kinds of uh, professional achievements that one has had depending upon the model that one takes up. A uh, small s here refers to the years of schooling, uh, q is a vector of school and uh, teacher characteristics that uh, 
uh, that tell us about the quality of uh, schooling that one has had and what impact that has had on the skills learned. So, for example, whether it is a government school, a private school or uh, whether it is a school which has uh, various kinds of uh, uh, teacher training programs and that may have improved the teacher quality or whether there has been more interventions on the school going children that has improved uh, uh, skills uh, learned by the children and so on. Uh, C here is a uh, vector of uh, child characteristics including the uh, innate ability of the child to be able to uh, learn the uh, various kinds of uh, imparting that is carried out in the schools. H is a vector of household characteristics. Uh, for example, the uh, whether it is a richer household or a poorer household and what impact that has or the resources available uh, with the households, uh, how that impacts uh, the uh, learning outcomes. I is a vector of school inputs under the control of households such as children's daily attendance, effort in school and in doing homework and purchases of school supplies. Now, this is a very is an example production function uh, for education and of course, given the context that we are studying uh, education production function, the country context, the subnational context, uh, we can of course, uh, extend this production function by including much more variables as well. So, the fact that expenditure on education does not explain well cross country differences in learning outcomes is indicative of the intricate nature of the process through which such outcomes are produced. I mean to say here that when we look at production function of education, it is not just the quantifiable variables that can help us explain how that impacted learning outcomes, but there are various processes in place that goes on to act upon these uh, quantifiable variables and often it is not possible to quantify various processes that can um, tell us how it has impacted learning outcomes. For example, you have a very good teacher or a very bad teacher uh, whose uh, skills cannot be quantified uh, as far as the production function is concerned, but then that has impacted the uh, child's learning process and that shows up in education achievements. So, production function basically provides a conceptual framework to think about the various determinants of learning outcomes and this conceptualization is important and it highlights that for any given level of expenditure, the output achieved will depend on the input mix and consequently this implies that in order to explain education outcomes, we must rely on information about specific inputs, which is why often there are agencies within the countries and different countries across the world that actually solicit information about various kinds of inputs within education institutions, whether there is sufficient infrastructure, whether there is quality infrastructure or not, for example, whether there is a playground or not, whether there is a boundary wall or not, these are all uh, specifications that go towards formation of what is called a school and how these uh, become a part of the um, input uh, variable that goes on to uh, impact learning outcomes. Available evidence specifically on the importance of school inputs uh, suggest that learning outcomes are very sensitive to improvements in quality of teachers than to improvements in class sizes. And uh, this is based upon various empirical studies that have been carried out based upon these kinds of production functions where uh, it has been uh, proved that quality of teaching and quality of teachers goes on to improve schooling output or learning uh, achievements. Regarding household inputs, uh, many experimental evidences suggest that interventions that increase uh, the benefits of attending school, example conditional cash transfers are particularly likely to increase student time in school and those that incentive, incentivize academic effort are also likely to improve uh, learning outcomes. Uh, for example, in the context of India, we often take example of the midday meal program. There are various kinds of conditional cash transfers program that are linked to vaccination among children and so on that has also gone on to show that uh, they have gone on to increase uh, student time in schools and also um, incentivizing children in the form of merit scholarships, etc. has also gone on to increase uh, learning outcomes. Policy experiments have also shown us that preschool investment in demand side inputs have led to large positive impacts on education and other important outcomes later in life. So, which is why uh, there is a lot of focus currently on early childhood 
uh, education and how the gains that uh, children make uh, in the preschool uh, period uh, goes on to uh, benefit them during the schooling process, during the primary schooling process and that also impacts the overall learnings uh, during the entire period in which the child is getting education. The environment that children are exposed to early in life also plays a crucial role in shaping their abilities, behavior and uh, talents. So, this in a nutshell explains to us how different variables can be considered as a part of the production function of uh, education. Now, we have already uh, been introduced to this concept of demand for education. So, when we are saying uh, demand for education, we must also understand that education is uh, not just a private good, it can also be a social good because uh, we have learnt about education as creation of minimum capabilities and creation of minimum capabilities also gives rise to the fact that you have more responsible citizens within the country who can participate better in social processes. So, when we say demand for education, we are not just necessarily talking about demand for uh, the private demand for education because obviously private demand gives rise to private returns to education, but there can also be social demand for education and we need to distinguish between the two. So, private demand for education generally can have uh, satisfied demand which means a person who is demanding education gets enrolled in school and stays in the institution for the period enrolled or there can be unsatisfied demand in the sense that one demands education, one wants to be in the education process but for various reason is not able to enroll himself or herself in uh, educational institutions. That could be because of income considerations or it could be because of non-availability of schools and educational institutions in the vicinity of the uh, neighborhood in which the person is staying. Or there can also be partially satisfied demand, for example, one gets enrolled in education institution but for various reason drops out of education institution. Uh, so, this is what we consider within the domain of private demand and there can be various uh, uh, estimations surrounding um, the private demand uh, estimation. There can be various reasons that contribute to all of these conditions. One of the uh, reasons that contribute to uh, satisfied demand or unsatisfied demand or partially satisfied demand is the price of education, the cost of education. As we have seen in the last class at marginal cost and marginal benefit or the comparison of uh, the present value of expected returns from education and the cost that one is incurring on education becomes an important criteria for uh, choosing uh, education or choosing the number of years one wants to be invested in education in the current period. Now, price of education can include direct costs or indirect costs. We have uh, studied this in the last class as well, where we looked at direct costs as uh, fees and other expenses, indirect costs are the opportunity costs foregone or other out of pocket expenditures that are directly not contributing to education, uh, but for some other uh, purposes. So, what are the determinants of private demand for education? Uh, generally, demand for education has inverse relationship with uh, cost uh, and it has a positive relationship with income. Uh, we have seen uh, in the uh, last class as well that income seem to be positively correlated with education or demand for education and cost had an inverse relationship uh, with demand for education. Now, these are some of the individual factors and social factors that can be considered as the determinants of private demand for education. As far as the individual factors are concerned, some of the uh, common, most common variables that we take are family size, income, uh, the gender of the person. Uh, for example, in many developing country contexts, we have seen that there is a premium placed on education of male child and that of female child, but of course, things are changing now. Particularly in the Indian context, we see that enrollments of girls have increased and learnings um, as with regard to uh, female uh, students both in uh, secondary uh, schooling or higher education institutions have been increasing. Other household expenses also play an important role with respect to demand for education. Parents education level, if someone's parents are very educated, then they would want to spend uh, on the education of their children. Uh, although aspiration levels also play an important role, parents may not be educated, but the overall aspiration levels of uh, acquiring education is so high that they may want to spend on the education of their children.
similarly occupation of parents importance of child well being in the family these are all individual factors that go on to determine demand for education along with individual factors there can also be social factors for example distance from home from uh, educational institution availability of educational institutions um, the medium of instruction often becomes an important criteria availability of public schools available infrastructure the social value attached to education again is very important with regard to uh, pursuing education and uh, finally waiting time for employment and this is something that we have discussed in detail in the last class so i'll leave that out here um, along with private demand for education there can also be social demand for education uh, starting next week i will uh, start discussing about the role of externalities in education and why uh, we need to look at the social aspects of education and what are the different problems that it gives rise to but let us also try to understand in this class today that when we are talking about demand for education it is not just a private demand for education there can also be a social demand for education so generally if we live in an educated society if we are interacting with educated individuals we feel good about the fact that we are living in an achievement oriented society let's say for example so the social demand approach treats education as a service demanded by the commodity just like any other good or service it regards educational planning as the process of forecasting demand to establish adequate institutional arrangements to meet the demand now while private demand is defined as the enrollment in an educational system the social demand is defined as aggregate of individual demand and private demand is estimated by the uh, data collected at the household level but social demand for education is determined by uh, taking the aggregate data at a state or the country level so these are issues that provoke uh, questions in our mind with regard to is education a private good or a public good is education a consumption good or an investment good is it a local good or a global good and are benefits derived of education good commensurate with the costs incurred on them so these are all issues that we will take up in a few weeks time now education is a valuable investment that we have understood both individually and collectively and the most common way to measure the private returns to education is to study how attainment improves individual labor market at outcomes usually by attempting to measure the effects of education on wages regarding social returns the most common approach is to measure the effect of education on pro social behavior example volunteering or political participation interpersonal trust and economic growth and so on and various studies have been carried out on uh, these lines and we'll discuss some of uh, the major findings based upon global data without taking examples of specific studies now before we move on to the second part let me also sort of familiarize uh, the learners with uh, some uh, very simplistic and basic ideas about private returns to education and social returns to education because if we can talk about private demand for education that obviously means that the returns to uh, private education or pr to returns to private demand are uh, internalized individually but when we talk about social demand for education the returns to education is for the society at large so to be able to make a clear distinction between the two let us familiarize ourselves with what these concepts really mean so private returns to education refer to the benefits that an individual gains as a result of obtaining education and these benefits may be financial or non financial for example higher earnings uh, is an important uh, private returns to education because uh, individuals with higher levels of education typically earn much uh, more over their lifetime compared to those with lower levels of education employment opportunities is another important uh, private returns to education career advancement and similarly there can be non financial benefits for example getting more information about how to improve your health conditions or greater life satisfaction because of having access to better information as you are more educated and enhanced cognitive skills and so on but social returns to education refer to the broader benefits that society gains from the education of its members and these benefits go beyond the individual and include economic social and cultural gains some of the important ways in which we try to capture social returns to education in the um, context of economics of education are its correlation with economic growth an educated workforce it is seen has contributed positively to overall economic growth 
reduced public expenditure, higher education levels can lead to lower crime rates and reduced costs for social services and health care. Uh, often there is a, uh, Becker has contributed a lot to this area and there are many scholars after him who have contributed to the idea of, uh, to the connection of education and crime or poverty and crime and that is an area that many people have worked on, uh, interested learners can look into it. Civic participation education tends to increase civic engagement such as voting and community involvement. Similarly, social cohesion education can promote social cohesion and reduce inequality by providing individuals from different backgrounds with more equal opportunities and needless to say increases in overall levels of education also gives rise to innovation and technological advancements which contributes to innovation research and technological progress of the society. And what are the comparisons and implications of uh, private returns and social returns? Private returns basically focus on the direct benefits to the individual such as higher wages and better job prospects and these returns are typically measured through increased lifetime earnings and improved uh, employment outcomes. But social returns encompass wider benefits to society such as economic growth, reduced social costs, increased civic engagement and these returns justify public investment in education as the benefits extend beyond the individual to the entire society. Uh, so, with this uh, we uh, end the first part of the lecture where I try to familiarize the learners with some basic ideas about how do we understand a production function in education and what are the different variables that we generally tend to take as a part of production function of education, uh, why it is important to differentiate between private demand for education and social demand for education and um, concurrently why it is important to understand private returns to education and social returns to education. And we have also seen that the implications of having private returns and social returns to education are also different and it is important to have both private returns and social returns. So, in the second part of this data, I have taken global education data from our world in data.org to understand that um, when we say uh, production of education and returns to education, how these different variables that different scholars have worked on, how is it looking at, uh, what are the different kinds of output that it gives rise to when we compare it across different countries and what are the broad trends that are uh, coming out. So, let us first look at this figure here uh, which shows public education expenditure as a share of GDP between the period 1870 to 1993. I found this uh, to be particularly interesting uh, because uh, if we look at these, uh, this figure it tells us that the advancement of idea to uh, provide education for more and more children only began in the mid 19th century when most of today's industrialized countries had started expanding primary education. Most of the industrialized countries today uh, started expanding their primary education with the help of public expenditure on education. And this visualization uh, plots uh, public expenditure as a share of uh, GDP on the y axis uh, for uh, a number of early industrialized countries and shows that this expansion took place mainly through public funding. Uh, I have provided the source of this information from uh, our world in data and if you uh, visit the link that I have mentioned on this slide, you can actually see a time lapse figure from 1870 to 2022 on how public education expenditure has changed in different countries across the globe. So, the important point in this figure is that uh, it is only in the middle of 19th century that expansion of education at a large scale started taking place. Uh, but most importantly, expansion of schooling when it started taking place, it happened mostly through public expenditure on education or the public expenditure share in GDP was very high uh, in the currently uh, industrialized countries of the world. The second figure if you look at this gives us the average uh, OECD uh, countries uh, figure on how much they are spending on primary schooling, how much of public expenditure goes into uh, primary schooling uh, in these OECD countries. 
and this shows that primary education continues to be publicly funded in industrialized countries even in the for a large part of the 2000s continuing even today primary education continues to be publicly funded in the industrialized countries or the OECD countries and these countries have pioneered the expansion of primary education from the 19th century these are all OECD member states and they have relied heavily on public funding to do so Today, public resources still dominate funding for the primary, secondary and post-secondary non-tertiary education levels, meaning the uh, primary and secondary schooling levels. In the last decade, the share of public funding for these levels of education has decreased slightly, but the broad pattern gives us a remarkable picture of how uh, public expenditure has been very high as far as primary and secondary schooling is concerned. For the benefit of learners, I have compiled the list of OECD countries on this slide. So, these are basically the uh, currently industrialized countries who started uh, spending massively, contributing their public spending massively on uh, primary and secondary schooling right from the middle of the 19th century. Now, also the fact remains that the world uh, is expanding funding for education even today. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, India's uh, position here in this uh, graph, you would see that for a large part of this uh, uh, year, the data is missing for India, but then the share of public spending on education as a share of GDP has mostly has been fluctuating. But if you look at the trend, it is mostly on an increasing trend, but it is still much lower compared to the many industrialized countries. The data is highly irregular due to missing observations. Uh, but as incomes measured by GDP per capita are generally increasing across the world, this means that the total amount of global resources spent on education is also increasing in absolute terms. That also means that today we live in an educated world and uh, the uh, amount of resources that we are spending on education has been increasing by in leaps and bounds. Now, this is an interesting figure that I have put together from the website I just mentioned. Uh, this one in high income countries, we see that the households uh, shoulder a larger share of education expenditure uh, at higher education levels than at lower levels, but in low income countries, this is not the case. So, in the, the first panel of the figure here shows 15 high income countries, the lower panel shows the 15 low income countries. The orange dots are the uh, expenditure made on tertiary education or higher education. Green dots are the expenses made on uh, secondary education and the blue dots are the expenses made on primary education. If you look at the uh, pattern of the dots on the first panel and the pattern of dots on the uh, second panel, you would see that you have more green dots and blue dots. Uh, the pattern reverses, you have more orange dots uh, uh, here which means that the households are mostly spending on tertiary education or households are spending more on uh, private expenditure on tertiary education or higher education is more in the highly advanced countries. Whereas, if you look at the low income countries, you would see that the spending is more on secondary education and as well as on primary education. Now, what does this uh, really mean? I have explained these uh, figures in this slide. The visualization shows the percentage of total education expenditures that have contributed directly by households in 15 high income countries and low income countries. Uh, the top chart in this figure corresponds to high income countries and it shows a very clear pattern that households contribute the largest share of expenses in higher education or tertiary education and the smallest share in primary education. So, if you look at the blues here, they are spending very less on primary education, but they tend to be spending very high on higher education. So, roughly speaking, this pattern is actually a progressive one because this tells us that since students from wealthier households are more likely to attend tertiary education and therefore, these individuals who attend tertiary education are likely to receive very large private benefits of education because when you are if you uh, can recall the uh, discussion that we had about uh, the opportunity cost foregoing and then the amount of outlay one has to make on education in expectation of the future benefits that one is going to receive out of education. This is what we were talking about that if you are spending more 
time on education in the current period which means that your demand for quantity of education is uh, more during the current period that means that you are expecting better returns to education better private returns to education. So, the understanding here as to why developed countries across the world are spending more on higher education means that they are expecting more private returns to education. But primary schooling and secondary schoolings, the public spending on the education in these countries is much higher compared to what they are doing for higher education. But you contrast this with the bottom chart which shows a very different picture that in several low income countries households contribute proportionally more to primary education than to higher levels. And Malawi is uh, a notable uh, case in point here uh, which uh, the tertiary education is almost completely subsidized. You see that the patterns are completely reversed, the orange dot is the lowest and uh, blue dot is in between and secondary schooling dot is the highest. This shows that household contribute with almost 20 percent of the costs in primary education. Therefore, such distribution of private household contributions to education is regressive where households have to spend more on uh, providing basic education where the social returns to education is very high. It is uh, understood that when uh, everybody is uh, minimally educated or have had at least access to primary schooling or secondary schooling. The social returns to education are much higher because you are dealing with a somewhat educated workforce. But when you are investing more on your education, on private education, then your private returns to education are much higher. So, ideally speaking, uh, the more progressive thing to do would be to have public spending on primary education and secondary education and private spending on higher education. But what we see is that in some of the poorest countries of the world, there is regressive distribution of household incomes which means that the higher education is completely subsidized or near subsidized, but uh, the household spending on uh, primary education and secondary education is much higher. And this has serious implications for uh, for inequality within the country, it has implications for uh, poverty within the country and the overall levels of economic growth. If you look at this figure here, this uh, tells us that do countries that spend more public resources on education tend to have better education outcomes. There are three figures here. The first figure on the top correlates education expenditure as percentage of GDP with average years of schooling. Uh, the second figure uh, shows uh, the education expenditure as percentage of GDP with some mean PISA scores. I have a short note put together towards the end of this class on what are these PISA scores. These are basically test scores. And then uh, the uh, third figure uh, shows the correlation between average years of schooling and the average uh, test scores. So, this visualization presents the, these three scatter plots. And at a cross sectional level expenditure in education you would see uh, correlates positively with both uh, quantity and quality. So, this first figure here correlates uh, quantity of education with uh, education uh, expenditure. And if we consider uh, the scores test scores as quality this correlates quality with uh, education uh, expenditure here. So, one of the first observations is that if you look at the figures here, you would see that they are positively correlated, both quality and quantity measures are uh, positively correlated. But this positive correlation does not imply causation because there are many factors that uh, simultaneously affect education spending and outcome. And these scatter plots also show that despite the broad positive correlation, there is substantial dispersion away from the trend line. If you look at the different dots across the trend line here, you would see that there is substantial dispersion away from the trend line. And that means that there is substantial variation in outcomes that does not seem to be captured by the differences in expenditure. Now, does cross country variation in government education expenditure uh, explain cross country differences in education outcomes? This visualization here presents the relationship between test uh, scores uh, on reading outcomes and average education spending per student 
uh, for different countries. It shows that income is an important factor that affects uh, both uh, expenditure on education and education outcomes. Uh, we see that above a certain national income level, the relationship between the test scores and education expenditure per pupil becomes uh, non-existent. And uh, several studies with more sophisticated econometric models also uh, support the fact that expenditure on education does not explain well the cross-country differences in learning. And this is something that I have covered in the earlier classes as well that income cannot be the sole determining factor of education outcomes. There are various other confounding factors, for example, quality of learning or uh, pedagogy or the kind of uh, uh, teacher staff that we have recruited uh, that also goes on to explain the learning outcomes. Now, if you look at uh, uh, this figure here, this figure shows the private returns to education for different countries. Uh, for uh, bachelor's or equivalent in uh, light blue, master's degree or equivalent in uh, dark blue and all tertiary education in uh, the, the triangles here, uh, small triangles here. The y-axis uh, is an index of income uh, or the index of uh, returns to education in the form of income. So, what you would see here is that countries such as Brazil and Chile have some of the highest returns to uh, tertiary education. Now, what does this mean? This basically says that countries with the and these are also the countries not shown in the figure here. These are also the countries uh, which have very uh, less, uh, where tertiary education is very less uh, prevalent among the adults. But these are also the countries with the greatest returns to tertiary education. And this is indicative of the demand and supply dynamics that contribute to determine wage differentials across different countries. Demand for skilled workers usually come at a premium as they are short in supply. So, what this basically means is that the returns to tertiary education is very high in countries such as Brazil and Chile, although there are very few people pursuing tertiary education, which means that the and we have already seen from various studies that the levels of income inequalities are very high in uh, Brazil, for example. And these are countries where given the inequality levels and given very few people who can afford tertiary education or are in education, the returns to education are very high because there is a very high demand for people who have acquired the skills from tertiary education. So, it is a simple case of uh, demand and supply, short people who are in short supply and therefore, there is a very high price on them professionally qualified people who are in short supply and therefore, there is a very high price on them uh, or demand for them. So, these figures again are simply correlations and cannot be interpreted causally and individuals with more education are different in many ways to individuals with less education. So, we cannot attribute wage differences solely to income here. Uh, similarly, studies have also been carried out which show that there is a whether there is a causal effect of education in earnings. Uh, these visualizations here show that the relationship between education and earnings uh, by comparing wages across education levels, uh, genders and age group and they show that, that if you look at uh, the uh, gender wise profile or the age wise profile uh, with uh, increases in levels of education, earnings levels increases and this is uh, true for both uh, men and women profiles. For both genders at any given age, individuals with more education will receive higher wages and this incremental benefit from additional education grows with experience. The differences in wages between people with varying degrees of education become larger as they advance in their careers. Uh, this is something that we have discussed in the last class uh, which had been studied in detail by influential thinkers like Schulz and Gary Becker and so on. So, one of the conclusions from these empirical studies tells us that education payoffs are not constant over the life cycle, but over a period of time. Uh, more uh, being uh, having acquired the stock of human capital uh, in the form of better education opportunities in the beginning stages of your life accompanied with being in the job market for a longer period of time and also acquiring experience and on job training and all of these contribute to uh, the more and more benefits uh, throughout the uh, lifespan. So far, we have discussed uh, about uh, private returns to education based upon the global data. Um, the global data also gives us uh, supporting uh, ideas about how uh, 
returns to education with respect to social returns to education are also achieved because of education attainments. Uh, countries with higher educational attainments in the past, for example, are more likely to have democratic political regimes today. There is a long-standing theory in political science that stipulates that a country's level of education attainment is a uh, key determinant of emergence and sustainability of democratic political institutions, uh, both because it promotes political participation at the individual level and because there is a collective sense of civic duty. So, under this hypothesis, we should expect the education levels in a country to correlate more with democratization in subsequent years. Uh, countries where adults had a higher average education level in 1970 uh, also seem to have more democratic political regimes today. This figure here, uh, this is an index by VDEM which shows electoral democracy today versus past average years of schooling. You would see that there are countries on the top end, for example, uh, United States uh, and uh, Switzerland and uh, Sweden and so on, uh, which have had uh, very early gains in uh, uh, education and uh, seem to have a very uh, mature democracy. Uh, whereas countries on the lower end, for example, Yemen, Egypt, Iran or Myanmar, Bangladesh and so on and so forth, where the levels of education have been uh, lower and there seems to be some amount of lowered levels of democratization of processes or democratic processes as well. India has also been uh, ranked uh, quite low uh, by VDEM in the last uh, few years as well as based upon data on education and democratization of institutions. Another important uh, correlation that we generally see in respect of social returns to education is uh, correlating women's education with uh, child mortality and it has been seen that women's education is inversely correlated with child mortality. Various studies have shown that if you educate uh, women, uh, the nutrition outcomes within the households improve and that ultimately impacts child mortality level as well. Uh, if you look at this uh, visualization here, you would see that there is a downward sloping uh, curve which basically says that as the years of education uh, increase as far as women are concerned, the x axis here shows the average years of schooling of women in the reproductive age bracket and the y axis shows the child mortality levels. It basically shows that as women's education levels increase, the levels of mortality among children have declined. That seems to be one of the uh, important aspects of looking at education as having social returns to education. And finally, education uh, outcomes predict economic growth. This has been uh, discussed extensively in various literature. Uh, this question is uh, motivated by the notion that aggregate education uh, or human capital generates positive spillover effects for everyone. A classic example of a mechanism through which education may yield such positive externalities is that aggregate education improves the country's ability to innovate as well as imitate and adapt uh, to new technologies uh, giving rise to technological progress and this has been studied and modeled in various growth models. Early studies found that schooling levels were poor predictors of economic growth. Uh, more recent studies uh, have confirmed the expected positive uh, link and uh, many scholars have concluded that better education does not only lead to higher individual income but is also a necessary precondition for long term economic growth. So, in the second part of the study we basically looked at um, the role of public expenditure as a percentage of GDP in expansion of education, uh, particularly in the industrialized countries of the world. We have seen that overall uh, in the last uh, few decades there has been an increase in uh, expenditure on education, although the levels in developing countries are much lower compared to the currently um, high income countries of the world who have had uh, past gains in education and who have made early gains in education right from the 19th century onwards. Similarly, we also saw that uh, private returns to education from tertiary education is very high and in the advanced countries uh, while uh, public education expenditure on uh, primary education and secondary schooling is higher or household expenditure on higher education is much higher which is basically a progressive trend. But if you look at some of the low income countries, it is vice versa. Uh, household spending on uh, primary schooling or secondary schooling is much higher compared to 
uh, the subsidized schooling in tertiary education and that points to a more regressive distribution of household uh, resources. We have also seen that in a more unequal countries such as uh, Brazil for example and that is probably true for many other countries across the world who are uh, who have very high levels of income inequalities uh, where uh, very few people have greater access to resources. Uh, for example, if they have better access to higher education opportunities, then their private returns to higher education is much higher because of the premium placed on uh, the uh, demand for higher educated individuals. And uh, therefore, uh, countries where people have very less access to higher education institutions, we generally find that the returns to higher or the private returns to education are much higher. And finally, we also saw that um, the returns to education uh, change over a lifespan. Uh, it is uh, across uh, gender, uh, across age as well as by experience. And then uh, finally, we also saw that social returns to education are much higher when uh, it comes to uh, public expenditure on education, particularly when we correlate education with democratization of processes and institutions, uh, child mortality and women's education and economic growth in education and so on. So before I end today's class, just a small note on what are the PISA scores. These are basically an international score, uh, it is a program for international student assessment test scores which are a set of standardized test results used to measure the academic performance of 15 year old students across various countries. It assesses students uh, based on reading, mathematics and science and the purpose is a comparative evaluation of students across countries. It provides some kind of policy guidance whether the resources that we are spending on education, the investments that we are carrying out in education is uh, uh, giving rise to a uh, strong uh, educated workforce or not. Assessment domains are reading, mathematics and science and some of the examples of findings based upon the PISA scores are uh, high performer countries like Finland, Singapore and South Korea. They have consistently ranked high in PISA assessments and similarly equity in education PISA highlights disparities in education outcomes within and between countries prompting discussions on how to achieve greater equity in education. So I will end today's class uh, with this uh, summary that uh, uh, in this lesson we tried to uh, familiarize ourselves with the basic ideas about what is production of education, what are returns to education. We distinguished between private demand and social demand for education and private returns and social returns to education and based upon global data we saw that uh, public expenditure in education uh, gives rise to mostly social returns to education, but uh, private um, uh, expenditure in education uh, is more closer to providing uh, private returns to education. And there are a few more interconnections that we also saw based upon the global data. Uh, so I will end today's class with this. Thank you. Mm -hmm.